Well, it's a great pleasure for me to have Alan Bruff with us today to talk about his book on Jack Malik. Um, and it just so happens that today we received the news from the International Book Awards that Alan is a finalist in the biography uh, section um, for, the, for the year's best biography. So congratulations, Alan. Um, really pleased it's worked out uh, as well as it has. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm, I was, I guess we're always surprised to get those sort of accolades. But the thing that I think is so great about that is that um, it really means that people will be um, interested in reading the story without having necessarily an African or Rhodesian or Southern African yes. um, connection. And that'll at least make them interested in reading the, the biography. And I think that helps us tell our stories to the rest of the world. And that's really always been part of my intention is how can we preserve our history and tell it to the world, not just to ourselves, because yes. sort of we, we know the, the, the story. It's more about how do we tell the rest of the world what, what happened in our part of the world and who our heroes are. Alan, just hold the book up. So this is, this is the book, how it, how it appears. And as you'll see, it's a reasonably thick publication with sort of a couple of pictures in between. But um, just up a bit more. Um, that's the Jack yeah. Malik book and you can see the picture of Jack in the cockpit of the Spitfire there with the symbolic storm clouds in the background um yeah all right great um Alan let's just um let's get going on on, on talking about Jack uh just you know in my opinion I don't know if anybody in the private sector did as much contributed as much as Jack Malik did um during that uh, that difficult time to uh, to keep the country going, his contribution was was enormous, uh, and he took massive risks, um, and he really put the country way before his own uh, personal welfare. And while he wasn't um, a fighting man in the true sense during the Rhodesian War, I mean he was a fighter pilot in the battle of, in in the in the in World War Two, but. But he was right in the thick of uh, things, and, and I don't think there was anything he wouldn't have done for for the country that uh, he he absolutely loved and um, and gave and, and gave us all. But um, let's just go back uh, to Jack, just a little bit about his early history um, through up to the Second World War. Um. Jack was an interesting character and he grew up, um, his family or his fa uh, family immigrated to southern Rhodesia as it was at the time. When Jack was quite young, I think he was four or five, um, quite, quite young. Um, and, but from that very early age, he really had a, a passion and an interest in aviation. And of course, the family moved to um, Mtali as it was then. And there was only one aircraft in the whole town, and it was some rich fellow who had bought an aircraft. And Jack, after school, um, would go and just polish the aircraft and look at it and chat to this old guy and was fascinated by the, the aircraft. It was as if there was something in his blood. He was really passionate about this. Um, and so right from that early, early age, you could see that this was an extraordinary passion for him. Um, but interestingly enough, he didn't do well at school. He wasn't, he wasn't an academic. And, you know, these days when you think about pilots and the rigorous training, and even then there was rigorous training, lots of exams to get through. Um, yet Jack pretty much fell out of school at the age of 15 um, and didn't really pass his exams or anything. Um, and by 15, he was in an apprenticeship at a garage to basically um, service cars. And yet he always had this passion um, for, for aviation. And he was fixated on how could he become a pilot with these bad school marks, which everybody said to him wasn't enough to get him through. And when the war started, he actually saw that as his opportunity to try and get into aviation. And he refused to get involved in the war in any other way except becoming a pilot. 
to the point where actually draft dodgers were beginning to look look twice at him and think maybe maybe we need to see what's up with this guy. And he just said, I can join, but I have to be a pilot. And right, you know, as I say, right from that early age, he had that that passion um, to get into aviation. And I think that that was really the theme of his life. And then uh, you know, he he then trained in 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 Rhodesia. Uh, yeah, Rhodesia became really a training center for pilots. And I think that's probably why we had such, as a nation, such an, an interest and sort of involvement in, in aviation uh, as a result of that. We had six training schools. They were called RATAG training schools, R-A-T-G, I think. Um, and those were um, training schools at the different air bases that were actually built for that World War II training. And we, we were seen, I think, Rhodesia and Canada and a couple of other places were really seen as the the funnel for for pilots to to get to the front line, um, and that was where um, Jack got into that process pretty much at the end of it. Because by the time they eventually let him let him onto the course, and it was only through literally the recruiters being worn down by him coming in every week saying, "I've got to be on this." Um, by that stage, they were actually looking more for navigators and um, bombers and, and engineers and that sort of thing. And they said to him, look, you, with your mechanical background, you'll be perfect for an engineer. That's what you've got to do. And he refused. Um, but he did eventually get onto it and went through, um, uh, Thornhill, um, and, um, a couple of other of the, the training schools before finally being, uh, getting his wings and being sent to Egypt where he did his combat conversion training. And, um, Alan, what was his tie-up with with uh, the man who was to become Prime Minister, Ian Smith? Were they in the same squadron? I can't remember. They were in the same squadron. It was 237 Rhodesia Squadron. And a lot of the pilots who went through the the training in, in Rhodesia and who were from the country were earmarked for 237. So a lot of them went into 237 Squadron, which ended up being a Spitfire Squadron. Um, they were... Their motto was actually um, first in the air, and they were literally the first squadron to engage in in combat at the beginning of the Second World War. They'd been put uh, deployed up into um, um, central central North Africa, basically the Somali Somaliland border, and they were the, literally the first in the air upon the declaration of the Second World War. Um, Ian Smith had gone into two three seven squadron. A little bit ahead of of Jack Malik, he'd been there about a year before, um, so he was already quite a senior pilot by the time Jack arrived at the squadron. Jack arrived there because it took him so long to get onto the training. He arrived at the squadron really at the beginning of 1944, and I think Ian Smith had been there at least a year before. Um, so they didn't really know each other well in those first early couple of weeks, but quite quickly they started flying together. And in Jack's logbook, you can see quite a few of the sorties that they did. They flew together, so they obviously got to know each other um, quite well. Um, Ian also arrived at the squadron a little bit after Jack did because he had been in hospital after his his accident, where he did so much damage to to his his face. Um, and I think that's also an interesting reflection on Jack that Ian didn't look good. He'd had experimental plastic surgery and and had a lot of uh, injuries from that accident, and Jack embraced him as a friend. They got on really well. Never thought twice about about the scarring and 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 how how Ian looked because it took him a long time to recover from that. But they ended up being being good friends, and that friendship continued for the rest of um, rest of Jack's life. Yeah. Um, was was he shot down, Alan? Um, yeah, they both both of them were Ian and Jack. Jack was shot down in early um, 1945, and in fact, the squadron. The Rhodesia squadron suffered most of their casualties in those last few months of the war in 1945. Um, Jack had been hit by flak on numerous occasions um, prior to that. They were in the thick of thick of battle, chasing the Germans really up uh, Italy and and back into into mm -hmm. Germany as mm -hmm. as that front was collapsing. Um, so if you read Jack's logbook, there's quite a lot of references of his tail having to be re replaced from flak damage and all that sort of thing. But when he was shot down, um, he was uh, strafing and got caught um, in a sort of hail of flak, which hit the engine and he had a glycol leak, which is the cooling system of the Spitfire. 
So he knew he had about three minutes to fly before uh, the plane would catch fire or, or something, you know, or the engine would seize. Um, and he was flying over mountainous t terrain. Um, so he got a, as far away as he could, tried to keep altitude, was losing altitude. And uh, eventually when the engine did seize, um, he realized he, he had, to, had to jump out. Um, he was a little bit low though. So bailed out and the, the bailing out was problematic because he got caught on, I think the ferry pistol caught his parachute and it was a difficult exit. Um, and as he fell, he also caught his watch, his watch his father had given him. And as he fell out the, the cockpit of the aircraft, his watch came off and he saw it in the end, was trying to, to grab it because it was very, had great sentimental value. And of course, forgot to pull the ripcord and then would realize that he was too low, pulled the ripcord and hit the ground very hard because he had, it had hardly opened by the time he hit. Um, and when he, he sort of came to, he, there was an angel over him looking down at him. And everything was white and you know it was quite ethereal and he just presumed that he had died and this and he, he was quite pleased that angels looked like what what we interpret them to be then of course he realized when he felt the pain in his leg he'd actually landed in a, in a graveyard um in the city of piacenza in italy and quickly the sort of locals came grabbed him and took him away and hid him um and uh, he had done a lot of damage to his one leg he had shattered his ankle quite badly and that began began a whole story of being hidden by the um, partisans moved around and all the time his leg was getting worse and that was a big whole part of the story in itself you know um, but yeah he had quite a lot of drama and was eventually flown out from behind enemy lines in a captured German storch they eventually got him out that way so he certainly had an interesting um, escape at that point and he arrived back at the squadron literally about a week or two before the end of the second world war Alan, after the war, he came back to Rhodesia um, and he, he, had a, he had a garage in Merendellis, I think, in a sort of transport company for a while. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> his parents, um, Jack came back from the war and he was changed when he came back. Um, while he was with the partisans, the family that had taken him in, in Piacenza, um, they had a couple of, of daughters and Jack fell in love with one of the daughters and the two of them and the, the second daughter, the, the, both the daughters, were sent off with the partisans into the mountains to hide. The parents actually said, got rid of them all because the Germans were, were hunting for, for this pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so Jack didn't want to come back. He wanted to stay with this girl and, you know, really build, build his life there with her. And the parents sort of objected to that. They hadn't seen their son for a good couple of years because of the war and they were desperate to see him. And it was a big mission to get back. You know, it wasn't, we didn't have easy transport as we do now. But when he came back, he was, he was definitely changed. He was wounded. And I think the war affected him. And so what he did is he went off and tried prospecting, went up to Bechuana land, did a bit of prospecting. And during that time, Jack's father thought, look, we need to, we need to sort of consolidate you and come together and hold Jack. I think that was really the plan. So he was the one who decided, let's go and run a family garage in Marindellis. And Jack had the garage background from his apprenticeship before when he left school. And his father was very good at running, running a business. He was very mechanical. He used to be a, a, a truck driver for the Rhodesian Railways, as it was at that stage. And Jack's mother had a financial background so she could run the book. So they set up and ran this family business there. And after a while, um, the, his parents had a bad accident and that sort of killed the business to a degree. But Jack stayed on, got his own garage there and actually then inherited his father's trucking business and, and ran trucks as well. So ran quite a successful business for quite a long time. It was probably eight or 10 years that he ran that in um, Marindellis. Um, uh, probably throughout from 1945 to about 1951, 52, that was his primary focus the garage and his trucking business but um it, it was all a bit got a little bit boring for him and he, well, he was looking for a bit more excitement how it worked out is that one of the guys who ran a competitive trucking business in marindellis also had an airplane he had bought a little aircraft world war ii surplus one and and used to take off from the backyard. He had a little grass strip at the backyard and would take off and go and fly around. It was just a little two-seater aircraft. 
But of course, that fascinated Jack. It was rather like how when he was a school kid, he used to go and, you know, pamper this aircraft, never flew in it, but, but just loved it. So became friends with this guy, a chap called Jamie Marshall. And they, it was through the aircraft that they became friends and competitors. And one night they were at dinner at the Malik's. They'd invited the marshals over and they were chatting about that. And the, the wives were saying how terrible it was. You couldn't get fre fresh fish pretty much anywhere in Rhodesia at the time, especially Marinellas. And of course, Jamie and Jack started saying, well, I wonder if you couldn't fly it in. And that was the genesis of fish air. And they eventually decided to go into partnership in, in the aircraft, bringing in, in fresh fish. Of course, the two-seater was too small. They bought another one, bought another one. But it was really, again, Jack's passion for aviation and flying that really opened that opportunity. And he gave up the trucking business and went into full-time flying as a result of that. And that was his way in. But he had always been passionate about keeping up with flying. Alan, um, I know he got involved in the Nigerian Civil War, uh, the Biafran secessionist movement. But uh, tell us how that, that actually happened, how, how he came to be involved. That was really, um, and you, you, we were talking a little bit earlier about sort of fighting men of, of Rhodesia. And I think that Jack really qualifies when you think about why he got involved in these sort of conflicts and, and what drew him to them and what his um, sort of belief and, and commitment was. It was really driven by a need to help people. He had a very um, strongly Christian upbringing mm -hmm. um, and he had a, a very strong sense of morality and what was right and wrong. And at that time, from sort of the late 50s, um, the winds of change were blowing through Africa and, and all of the there was a rash of, of independence uh, across all of the different colonies there. And where Jack's involvement um, in sort of military flying started was actually not with Biafra, but with Katanga. Um, and Jack was, a, although his mother and grandfather were both um, very good accountants, Jack was terrible at accounting. He, he couldn't follow the money for, for the life of him, but he loved flying. And consequently, he would run these <clears throat> charter businesses and these aviation operations, but they never really did very well financially. And what happened is he was tempted by his neighbor to take very good and very lucrative um, charter contracts for this province in Congo called Katanga. And he was actually compelled to do it. He didn't want to because it, it was quite dangerous at the time because the Congo really fell apart almost straight after independence. But Jack took these contracts on in the beginning because he had to, from a financial point of view, he really needed the money. So he took them on for the money, started flying there, and then very quickly got to see the political situation on the ground and realized how this province was really trying to work with um, sort of a multiracial approach and um, a more uh, democratic approach mm -hmm. and trying to resist the the communist encroachment that was with which was right on the tails of the winds of change and that really gave jack a great passion to commit himself his business to helping this little enclave that was trying to hold off um, and resist communism and it was as a result of that um, having gone through the whole katanga thing that when biafra came up he was very keen or very open to helping because it was very similar cause they were really a breakaway state trying to hold off from the federalists um, and to resist communist encroachment. Um, and that was really, I think, what got Jack involved. But it was ironic because when Jack went to Biafra for the very first time, he was again on the verge of bankruptcy. And the only way they got there was one of his employees. Um, on the day they were going to go, Jack looked at the numbers and he didn't have enough money available to buy the fuel to get there to take the contract. And they had to get there to take the contract. And so he basically went to the last of the employees that he had and said, look, we just can't do it. I'm done. And I'll, I'll split the money that I've got left with you to try and pay off as much of your salary as I can, but we're, we're done. And one of the employees came to him and said, look, I've got some savings. Can I put it on the table? That's enough money for the fuel. Let's go. And that was how he got there. And that, that was a transformational opportunity because for a year and a half, they or two years, they were being funded by the French Secret Service, um, and a lot of major backers. That was really where Jack got very involved with the French, and that served him for the rest of his life as well. 
And Alan, he, in the Congo, he got uh, obviously to work quite closely with Mike Hall, I think, uh, of Wild Geese fame. Um, and, and the guy that they were actually in support of was Moise Chombi, I think, who, um, who, was, a, who was a very moderate uh, African nationalist who could see that uh, the only way to responsible rule was to, was to secede. Um, so it's a pity that chaps like Mike Hall and, um, and Jack didn't, didn't prevail there in, the, in their efforts. Um, and the Congo has been a mess ever since. Um, well, I think that Chombi was, <clears throat> was well before his time. Um, even before uh, the Congo was granted its independence, he was talking about setting up the country as a federation of states. Um, because he was saying it's such a big country, you cannot rule one big country where the tribes are so completely different, speak completely different language. Um, and so he was advocating for that right from the beginning. And he also advocated for multiracial development and cooperation with the West, which the rest of Africa at the time were embracing the Chinese and, and the Soviets. Um, and almost on, I think, Jack's third, second or third trip into the Congo, he met with, with Mike Hall. Um, and Jack's own neighbor, the guy who got him this contract in the first place, turned out to be very involved. He was, he was essentially an early mercenary um, and was selling himself as a military advisor to whoever, whoever he could. Um, and that was really, so quite quickly, Jack got into this whole sort of mercenary movement. But Mike Hoare and Jack became good friends. They, they also remained friends for the rest of their life. And at the time, um, Bob Denard was also operating in, in Katanga. So that whole sort of club almost got, got to know each other in those, in those early days. Um, and to, to, as a reflection of Jack's character, he became close personal friends with President Chombi as well. And that's remarkable when you consider the, the whole sort of almost racial heritage that had been established in, in not just Africa, but throughout the colonies um, at, at the time. And yet, Jack built this personal friendship, which was extremely strong. Um, Jack and Chombi were, were close friends pretty much for the rest of Chombi's life. He didn't, he didn't live particularly long. He was a, a victim of all of that. But they, they were close friends to the point where when Chombi left and when Katanga collapsed, he gave Jack a couple of his own aircraft um, as gifts to A, pay the debt that he owed because he hadn't been able to, to pay a lot of Jack's bills. But it was, he also just said, look, you know, t take these as a thank you for all of the support that you've given my country in, in the time. And that helped Jack actually build up a fleet, which he couldn't have afforded at the time. And then along comes UDI. Ian Smith declares independence uh, and sanctions are imposed, international embargo, probably the tightest sanctions regimen in history uh, was imposed on Rhodesia uh, in, an, in an, a bid to throttle the country economically. And um, our Jack uh, came right to the fore very early on, didn't he? Um, he did. <clears throat> he was also quite a victim of, of sanctions in those early days. <clears throat> in, in 1965, I think it was, he was building up an airline called Rhodesian Air Services. And um, they, he, had, he had got routes for places like Mauritius. Um, he was working on a route, or in fact had routes into, Lund into England, had routes into Europe, and was really building an international airline. Um, and when UDI came along, a lot of those contracts were sort of cancelled overnight, and it became very much more difficult for him to operate. And he was sort of really struggling to try and keep the business going, taking any business he can could, charter business, that sort of thing. And that's what really got him involved in Katanga and then Biafra after that. Um, Biafra collapsed in the first weeks of 1970. And just before that collapse, Jack had also been worried about what was going to happen to his own country because he could see the writing on the wall. He had seen this playbook in Katanga and Biafra and several other places. So he knew what was coming. And it started in the mid 19s or mid 69, they're about looking into supplying beef to um, the Gabonese. Um, he became very close friends also with the, the president of Gabon. And Gabon was a springboard for his airlift into Biafra. So he had a base 
at a military airfield in, in Gabon. Um, and through those conversations, he realized there was very little good quality beef there. And he knew that we were sitting on a bunch of great Rhodesian beef. And he started that um, beef flight into, into Gabon. And so by the time Biafra fell, that whole sanctions busting um, beef run, as they called it, was beginning to happen. And that was really where he started to get involved. And I think that the contribution of that, when you think about fighting men, fighting men of Rhodesia, that was really where a lot of his initial fighting for the country started. Because when he started getting involved with things like um, uh, ammunition, weapons, that sort of thing, it really made a difference to our ability as a nation to fight. Um, and then later, as the war continued, and as Jack started to focus on Rhodesia, as opposed to places like Katanga, Biafra, et cetera, he got much more involved in the military flying as well. So he actually rolled up his sleeves and not only ran the civilian sanction busting operation, but got into, into combat as well. Alan, I think I'm right in saying um, it was the French intelligence services that helped uh, open up some of those channels. And that was as a result of the, the friendships that had built up during the Biafran uh, war. Uh, and, uh, and the French were very helpful in facilitating well, French intelligence in facilitating these flights and using Gabon as as a as an intermediary point to get stuff into Europe. Yeah, that's that's correct. And again, <clears throat> the French connection started in in Katanga. Um, the the French were very um, supportive of Katanga, but again, wanted to didn't want to do it directly. So they were quite standoffish, and they got Bob Denard and, and various other military advisors in there. But it was always in, in a semi-official capacity. They didn't really want to be involved, um, but were, were very active behind the scenes. And they were really a major financer of, of Biafra. And interestingly enough, worked with the, um, the South Africans on the Biafran airlift a lot. So South Africa was very involved there as well. Um, and it was really through their involvement that because I knew Jack from, from Katanga, it became um, a very um, comfortable relationship. They knew each other and they trusted each other. <clears throat> and that was one, really one of the things in that murky world of secret services um, where sort of trust and, and pre-knowledge were really important. Um, and Jack, a lot of the, the international secret services were involved in, in post-independent Africa. The CIA were very involved in the Congo, the French very involved in, um, Biafra. And that was really where Jack built up a lot of contacts and a lot of valuable um, connections through these different secret services. He was also involved up until um, independence with the, the British. The British used him quite a lot for uh, various operations. Um, I think they were very involved in the Yemen where Jack was doing um, uh, weapons flights in for Bob Denard and that sort of thing. So, but the French the French were supportive all the way, right up until, um, in fact, even after Zimbabwean independence, they were still using Jack for various operations. Alan, um, Jack, also uh, tell us a bit about the Oman connection. I, I think that that came about a lot to do with Tim Landon, the White Sultan, whose brother was a Marin, was a farmer in, in Rhodesia, and he opened up Oman to to the Rhodesians and Jack was the was the go-to guy there in and out of Oman. Yeah, the the need for Jack to <clears throat> Jack had a problem at the time in that by about 1973-74, um, Jack was the the benefit of Gabon <clears throat> was waning. Um, and the the Sunday Times in the UK did an expose on Jack in 1973 and really cracked open his whole story and how he was running this operation with the DC-8 through Gabon. And so the international community and, and this anti-sanctions movement um, got to know exactly how Jack was operating. And so what Jack needed to do from 74, 75 onwards, it became obvious he needed to find another route to Europe and another conjure that he could operate without the being scrutinized. Um, and that was really what started his interest in, in Gabon, I mean, in um, Oman. Oman. And 
they, we had already done, the country had already had some contact with Oman through um, Tim London. Um, and an introduction was made and Jack got to meet with Tim London and his local partners. And again, Jack got on very well, not so much with Tim London. I mean, they were friends, but Jack became very close to Tim London's uh, partners who were um, in the Omani, they, they were basically ministers in the Omani government uh, at that level. And uh, it was through that connection that they really built the operation. And after the first meeting, Jack suggested that they should set up an airline out of uh, Oman and, and essentially start operating the service based out of, out of Muscat. Um, and it took a while to do that because they needed to get another DCA to, to run that operation. And that was, a, as you can imagine, with sanctions, quite a difficult operation in itself. Um, but Tim Landon was definitely a very influential force behind that. Um, and really was was very sympathetic towards the country. And um, along that that uh, East Africa route up into Oman, um, that was really where the stepping stone was the Comores, and Jack used the Comores a lot as a result of that that route. But Oman opened up a lot of business for Jack, and, and I think we as a country did really well with that. There was a lot of trade with um, Iran at the time. <clears throat> The Shah was still running Iran and, and was very sympathetic to our cause and a lot of uh, business in that area as well. <clears throat> it was also close to Europe, so it was a route into Europe. So a very, very valuable route for us. Um, and that, that blossomed right up until independence and then pretty much went into an uh, absolute stop after that. The Omanis were very sympathetic to our cause because they'd gone through a similar thing. They were also subject to um, sort of communist encroachment had pushed it back and really understood the situation we were in. So we were extremely supportive. And we know when you look at the history, things like the, the helicopters coming through there, they provided a lot of training for us um, and really a big conduit of weapons through, the, through that route as well. Yeah, spare parts for the, for the Air Force. I think... I, think those, I was just going to say, those spare parts were interesting because... Um, the Omanis would turn a blind eye while Jack's engineers would go to these airfields and literally strip the old aircraft that were sitting there. There was a lot of old British hunters that had been based there. And some of those Air Force bases were, were active because there was a lot going on in the region. So the British were there manning those Air Force bases. Jack would fly in with his guys. They would strip aircraft almost right under the noses of the British and sometimes with their support. That's a fascinating chapter of the whole story as well. But um, we got piles of hunter wings and all sorts of things out, out of that area. Alan, uh, tell us a bit about um, Jack's involvement with the Air Force, with the military, with the SAS. Um, I mean, he was, he was all over the place uh, doing para drops. Um, the Shamoyo raid was really, uh, it, was, it was his decoy flight that was, that was um, a very important component in that whole plan. Just tell us about some of his the sort of escapades. Yeah, and I think this is really where Jack as a fighting man of Rhodesia comes to the fore. Um, he was absolutely fearless and and also I think really thought out of the box. He didn't he didn't believe necessarily what he was told. He always pushed the boundaries with his aircraft, with what he believed they could do. He never went by the book. And I think that's really what, what we as a country needed at the time. Um, he had got to know um, the, he, he got to know a lot of the, the leadership in the Air Force through having been, having flown during the war and also having been part of the Air Force in the 1950s, he was part of the Air Force Reserve. So knew the leadership of the, of the Air Force quite well. Um, went and did his Katanga and Biafra thing, came back, and in about 1976, they extended the, the call up and started calling up older people and the age group pushed up. So Jack got, essentially got called up to the Air Force at about the end of 1976. <coughs> and uh, they put him into the transport squadron because I mean, what else do you do with a, with a cargo uh, pilot uh, or ca a cargo captain? So Jack started flying for, um, flying the Dakotas and realized that all we had was Dakotas and started to think about the the opportunity to grow that because obviously the war was hotting up and he quite quickly said well look I've got this old DC-7 much bigger than the DC-3 
um, what can we do with that? Can, can I start contributing? And it was literally volunteering his aircraft, which was registered in Gabon at the time. It wasn't even a Rhodesian registered aircraft, civilian foreign registered aircraft. And the conversation then started because he was saying, we need more people to be, more paratroops to be dropped. Can we do this through the DC-7? And the operating manual of the DC-7 said it's impossible to fly without a door. If, if the door's off, you're done, you can't fly. Jack said, oh, no, I don't think that's the truth. I'm sure we can work around that. Took the door off, took it for some flights, and then started uh, with the Air Force uh, practicing parachute, parachute drops and, and that sort of thing. And, and they worked out how to do it. It was complicated though, because the line, the cable line had to be run on the floor instead of the ceiling, because you had to get the guys down to avoid the tail. So there was a whole lot of and turbulence and, and that sort of thing, because the aircraft went at a much higher speed. And they perfected that and used the aircraft, not just for parachute drops, but for supply drops of these um, raids into, into enemy territory. Um, and that was really where Jack's <clears throat> connection with the SAA started, because obviously they were very involved. He did a lot of the, the long ranged uh, drops for the SAS. And ironically, um, Jack's own son, he ended up joining the SAS as well. It was a little bit of a, a family affair there. Alan, tell us that story. What was that? They had to jettison something over Zambia at one stage. They were flying at night into Zambian airspace. And something went wrong. They had to kick out a crate or something, and the Zambians thought they were being bombed. Yeah, that, that was about probably about 1977. I can't remember the exact date. But it was a commercial flight from, um, from Europe into, into Rhodesia, as it was. And they had a problem with, um, and I think it was with the, the DC-7. The DC-7s were getting old at that stage, never ran on, on four engines. It was always one of the engines down. And uh, they had a, a problem with the, um, I, think, I think they had two engine failures on that particular flight. It was coming from, from Libreville in Gabon. Um, they didn't have a great deal of cargo on board. But with two engines down, they couldn't maintain height. So they were consistently um, dropping, um, not at a high pace, but they realized that they wouldn't be able to make, make it back home. So they decided to start jettisoning the, the, the cargo to try and save weight. And it was all industrial fertilizer. So they, they weren't supposed to be over Zambia. They um, were doing it in the middle of the night to try and shorten the route. And it was a, um, a unoccupied part of the country, so they were tossing this stuff out and organized. They they wouldn't they knew they wouldn't have the height to get above the escarpment, so organized to land at Kariba, which they did, and it was all fine, and they made it, and everything was great. But about a week later, <clears throat> Zambia complained to the UN about how these wicked traditions were chemical bombing them, and although there's no no parallel, there's a strong feeling that. It was because they had found all these chemicals, and that was really the the excuse for them to be able to raise an objection to the UN, which was debated in the UN about these terrible Rhodesians doing uh, having a chemical attack about, against the Zambian population. <laughs> um, yeah, Alan, um, uh, Jack's contribution to the Shamoyo, the big Shamoyo attack, just. Uh, Take us through how that all unfolded. That that was that was a very ambitious plan, um, basically because of the distances involved, and there were a couple of different um, um, camps that they attacked, and the there was a lot of resistance within the air force and the the military planners because it, they felt it was just too far, too ambitious, and and couldn't be done, um, and they were really re restricting the the raids to helicopter range <clears throat> um, that they could get in and out quickly. Um, and Jack, Jack, when he, he basically worked out the logistics of the plan and proposed the plan. Um, and that, as you say, included things like the decoy flight overhead. And a lot of that, um, it really, it took them about six months, I think, from the, the plan first being proposed to being accepted. Um, and it was really, I think it, the military planners took a long time to come to terms with the audacity of the plan. But I think it was really well planned in terms of the timing, the ability to, to get that far. Um, 
and the whole element of surprise um, there was a lot of people, and really that was what they were going for. They, they needed to try and cut off the flow of insurgents into the country. And they needed to then, uh, we could only win the war by having almost like a conventional battle um, outside of our territory where we could get the mass of insurgents before they, they dissipated in our own country and then became very difficult to find. So um, the thing about the decoy and, and what Jack wanted to do is he wanted to attack the base at the time when all of the recruits were on the parade field um, because they would be concentrated as a target and we'd be able to have the maximum impact. So what Jack suggested is that for the week or so prior to the attack, he just changed the route of his DC-8 aircraft coming back into Rhodesia to fly over the camp at a fairly high level so that it could be heard <clears throat> and of course, when they started doing that, after a while, the, the flight was timed to happen just at the time of the morning parade. So the first couple of times, obviously, everybody was nervous and hid. And after a while, they got used to it. And that was just obviously a commercial route. And they accepted it. And that plan actually worked perfectly because everybody on the day of the raid were on the parade ground. The aircraft went over. They heard the aircraft. They could still hear the whine of the aircraft, um, but were perfectly used to it, so stayed on the on the parade ground. But what was actually happening, that was the whine of the hunters and the Canberras coming in on the tail of the, the DC-7 that had flown overhead. And when, for the military planners' hesitancy, it was probably one of the most successful raids, not just of, of the Rhodesian War, but I think of any war. It, the, the casualty rate really tipped in the favor of the Rhodesians when you consider that thousands of the enemy were were killed and less than less than five uh, of the Rhodesians. in fact i think two or three were killed and about seven were were wounded um but the the numbers are just astonishing in in terms of the waiting uh, to the Rhodesians. and that really i think built the reputation of invincibility of the Rhodesians. but it was just such a precisely timed attack um, and, and Jack takes a lot of the credit for that. And that's really where I think he comes to the fore as a fighting man. Because as a fighting man, he contributed not just to the supply of our military, but to really effective and out-of-the-box thinking when it came to uh, attack plans and that sort of thing. And meticulous timing, coordination, resupply. A lot of these, I mean, some of these raids were one or two of them were over a thousand kilometers beyond our borders just unheard of at the time and then he got um he did get an award uh he was recognized um i can't remember what award it was that that he got but uh, he got one of the top civilian awards i think he got a couple actually um and i think he got the um <clears throat> first of all he got the um, Independence Commemorative Award um, for his his civil contribution, and that was in in sort of mid 1978. Um, and then at the end of 1978, he got the um, Commander of the Order of the Legion of Merit, and that was that was quite a quite a major award. Both of them were presented by the acting president at the time, um, and those were so those were the two medals that he got, or the two awards that he got during the Rhodesian War. Um, and he had a couple of medals already from his role during the Second World War. So he was quite well decorated. Quite ironic, though, because when, um, when the task force came into Rhodesia um, at the time of the election in 1980, um, a lot of the media, the foreign media, it was the first time they came into the country. So they were looking for stories. And a couple of them did stories on Jack. And they were talking about one of them, which I think is really ironic, out of a UK newspaper, was talking about Jack Malik, the hero without a medal. Um, the truth was that he had already received a couple of medals, but their point was, here's this guy who's got an incredible story and really is quite unknown. And that, I think, really epitomized or, or characterized Jack's life. He didn't like the limelight at all. And although he graciously accepted those awards, um, he, he didn't like being high profile. And I think that really went back to his involvement with the French Secret Service, the CIA, um, the British MI, M, MI6 um, prior to independence, he'd been involved with them, and very strong connections with things like the Bureau of State Security in South Africa. Um, and our own central intelligence organization, um, there's a lot of rumors um, that still persist that they actually financed um, the Afriteer operation. Um, and um, 
that, you know, so I think with all of that involvement with secret services, he didn't like the limelight at all. So, so tried to keep a low profile, um, but um, had a remarkable life, absolutely, and made a huge contribution to the Rhodesian War. And as you said at the beginning, I think without doubt, he was one of the most um, significant contributors to the entire war effort, both through the supply of, of weapons and just general spare parts and that sort of thing to keep the country going. I, you know, I think he could personally take claim to having kept the country going for, for years, but also to his role in, in the military. He was involved on, in, in a lot of different things. And also, personally, I mean, a lot of people don't know, he was involved with things like the hydrofoil on Kariba. So he seemed to be involved all over the show. Remarkable, remarkable man, um, Alan, and then a, a sad ending, but uh, in a way he was doing what he loved yeah. um, when it, all, when it all, all came to an end. And I know um, uh, he, was, he was extremely humble um, and he refused to acknowledge the fact that he had made such a huge contribution. He was very much of the opinion that he'd just done his duty along with everybody else. Uh, he never looked, never looked uh, for any, any recognition or, or any applause of any sort. I think that that again speaks to his character. And when you think about the opportunity that he had to make tons of money through his involvement with all sorts of deals that were going on, he never did. And, and I've, I've researched the story for, for literally 20 years, I've been researching the story. And I've never found evidence that he in any way exploited the situation that he was in. Sure, he made his money, he charged his fee. Um, but it was never extortionate. Mm -hmm. And it, it, he never leveraged the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to pull. And in places like Katanga, a lot of the, the, the expat or the um, mercenaries who were involved there, there was diamonds everywhere and they were pilfering left, right and center. There's no sign of that ever happening with Jack. And, and it's remarkable. Um, Jack was very against that. I mean, there was a lot of scandal with money being going missing in Biafra. And in fact, at one point, Jack was imprisoned in Togo for having an aircraft with about eight or 10 tons of banknotes on board. But every, every banknote was accounted for. Um, and it was, you know, the country needed it moved. They, they, the, the currency was being blocked, they needed to get it out, and, and Jack was happy to do that. And as I say, there's no sign that, that mm -hmm. he personally was involved in, in any of that. So his integrity was extremely strong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the family, the family suffered a lot as a result that he didn't really exploit those opportunities. Not that that's what you have to do, but, but he had a need for financial security and he never took the temptation, a remarkable, a remarkable person. But going back to the point that you said about his tragic end and, and how that ended, um, Jerry Perrin, who was one of the mercenaries that he had known from Katanga um, and who was involved in the mercenary revolt in the Congo in the 1967, when Jack died, um, Jerry actually said an interesting thing. He said it's a little bit like a, a Viking funeral because Jack couldn't have gone a better way because he went in, in the Spitfire that he loved. And it was a circular story of his career having started in Spitfires and really ending in Spitfires. And he said, you know, that's, that's a salute to a great man. Uh, an interesting image of the Viking funeral. Well, Alan, thanks very much for your time and uh, uh, well done again for getting this all down on the, on the record in, in print and um, now through this through, through this medium, um, let's uh, let's hope a lot more people find out about this this legendary figure, uh, Jack Malak, uh, a great man and a great tradition. And and I think that's as I said in the beginning, um, it's important to preserve these stories for history because when Jack did die at his funeral, a lot of people said, well, all of Jack's stories are going to go to the grave with him. And I think that was one of the things that really sparked my interest in telling the story, because I thought, what a tragedy that there's this great man whose stories will go to the grave and in time, he'll be forgotten. And I'm hoping that through the book, we can at least remind the world of people like Jack and the, and the example of Jack, because my God, right now, we need inspirational 
role models that we can try and fix what's going on around us. And Jack really, I think, is a remarkable role model of determination, patriotism, and really putting everything on the line for what is good and right. A lot of Jack's flying was about just helping the people on the ground. He flew refugees out of trouble spots, flew supplies in to help people get through. You know, it was really driven by the compassion yeah. for the civilians who are victims of these this craziness that's often around us. So we need those role models. So I think I think it's a great story that the world needs to hear. It certainly is. Alan, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate Thank it. I appreciate it. Thank you.